for that uh, kind introduction and kind invitation to be the first speaker for your first uh, uh, meetup for the new year. My name is Jules Damji. I'm a, a lead developer advocate in Endoscale. Um, before I was in Scale, I was working very closely both with Karen and, and Dorothy at Databricks for about six years. So this is like coming home to me and I'm, I'm very delighted and, and pleased and honored to be coming back to the Data Plus AI community and sharing some aspects of some of the things which are actually happening in the, in, in the, in, in the industry. So today's talk is going to be an array of framework for scaling and distributed Python and machine learning. Um, what we're going to do is, is sort of start with... Uh, sort of overview at a very high level, because this is the first talk on Ray, and some of you might have heard about Ray or probably haven't heard about Ray. So what I want to talk about is really start at the 20,000 20, level feet. What's the motivation behind Ray? What, what is Ray all about? Why Ray? And what's the ecosystem that, that allows people to write distributed application at massive scale? Uh, and then we'll drop down to about 10,000 feet below sea level, uh, to above sea level to the Ray architecture and components. You know, when you when you peel the curtain out, uh, what are the internals and what the guts of Ray? What how do, what does it look like? How things work behind the scenes? And then we'll go down all the way to um, the C level where we talk about the Ray core libraries, the native libraries, the APIs, the design patterns that allow people to write um, and scale digital applications. And then we'll look at um, the Ray latent libraries which are built on top of Ray. And in particular, I'll I'll, I'll give you a, a quick overview of Ray Tune, which is a very common library used by data scientists and ML engineers to tune uh, hyperparameter computing, which is a very common workload that people actually do. And also, if you get time, we'll try to talk about Xeboot Ray, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a demo that, that talks about Xeboot Ray. So that way we don't have to get into the slides. And then we'll, the demo is going to talk about what are the common workloads that you actually scale. You do training, you do inferencing, uh, and you do hyperparameter tuning. Those are the way uh, development cycle of that. And then I'll try to answer some questions that, that you have. So, um, so why Ray, you know? Um, but before we talk about why Ray, I think I think it's 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 fitting to to talk about some of the industry trends which are actually happening. So when the original creators of Ray, who were at Rice Lab, which is the same sort of crucible of innovation where Spark was developed in the pre predecessor of Rice Lab, which is Amp Lab, Mesos were developed at Amp Lab, uh, Tycoon was one of the uh, uh, distributed system developed. Uh, when the new Rice Lab actually came into being, the researchers and PhD students over there, along with Jon Stoika, who was a former uh, data executive and the founder there, uh, thought about, well, what are the things that are actually happening in the industry today? And I think there were three fundamental factors that I actually looked at. One was that machine learning is very pervasive in almost every domain today. And I think it's fitting to say, and I would contend that we have sort of entered what I would call the zeitgeist of ML, right? We are in a place where we have more applications being being affected uh, and written and are deployed in all areas of the vertical domain. You go from health to financial industry to automotive to uh, 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 scar industry to health. ML is is all of the place, <clears throat> and so it is very pervasive. And because of these sophisticated applications which are deployed in these industries, they require a fair amount of compute. They require a fair amount of compute. And the only way you can actually do that is to distribute at scale. And so now that was, that's, that was sort of the, fun, uh, the, 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 the first bit of it. The second bit is that because of this nature now, distributed computing is going to be a necessity. It's going to be a norm. It won't be an exception. Today, people are going to be just doing writing distributed applications as if they're writing Python functions and Python classes on the laptop, on the Jupyter notebook, and all of a sudden, it's, it's now running uh, seamlessly on the cluster. And this is going to be a norm and a necessity for, for us to meet these particular demands. And... <clears throat> One of the things, just to give you an idea of why that's actually is, is, is important, because if you look at how the ML applications and, and the deep learning images that have the, the, the trainings that has evolved over a period of 10 years, you see that the, de the, the demand of the petaflops needed to actually do this compute is increasing every 18 months. And the CPU load at which we actually increase is just not catch, catching up. So there is this in, enormous amount of gap between, this, between the demand and the supply. And you might say, well, what about the accelerators? Like we have GPUs and TPUs and they do make a difference. There's an incremental difference, but still there is this enormous gap that actually exists between 
what the today's very sophisticated both deep learning and, 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 and ML applications are being deployed uh, that actually require that. And it's not only just, just the fangs of the, of the world or the mangas of the world who are doing that. Ordinary startup companies are actually using the sophisticated application. They need the computer power to do that. And so we contend that the only way you can actually address this demand, the only way you can actually minimize the gap is to actually go out completely in a very distributed manner, right? And that's where <clears throat> the second demand is coming is that Distributed computing is a necessity. It's, it's going to be a norm, and we better be ready for it. And we better have frameworks. We better have programming languages. We better have compute strata that easy. It's very easy for data scientists and machine learning engineers to actually build that rather than, uh, rather than uh, ha uh, uh, having a very difficult time. And so the third, the third problem that they were trying to look at, the third trend was that those of you who are on call or those of you who have written distributed applications, those of you who have worked with, with other distributed applications, um, it's not easy, right? It's the, 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 the programming bit is a bit hard because you have to really understand a lot of concepts and it is notoriously hard. And if you look at the existing solutions that are out there, you can sort of put them into this two lens of the ease of development and the generality. And, and if you look at the middle, the median between the two, um, these are the systems which are sort of stitched together by, you know, uh, system experts, by SREs, by people who actually really understand the nuances of distributed computing. You got you know, MPI, Kafka, Spark, Flink, Spring, Horowood, TensorFlow, Kafka. They sort of stitch things together and they work. You know, it doesn't, it, 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 the existing solution work, but they're trade-offs, right? And trade-offs are sometimes they're hard to develop, sometimes they're hard to deploy and manage. And the reason being is that these are all bespoke solutions. They have different language semantics. They have different communication products. Protocols. So to make them work very harmoniously can be sometimes cumbersome, but they do work and they exist. So that's sort of the medium ground that people are actually doing today. We all use these systems uh, today. They, when they work, they work effortlessly. When they break, they do break uh, notoriously. If you go to the far right, I think there is this notion about not invented here. So we're going to start everything from clean slate. Do it yourself, right? So you can actually have a Docker container. You can just put it on Kubernetes. You can have all your application Dockerized and you run your communication using either the, the latest gRPC and you do it. Nothing wrong with that. It's very general. Uh, it scales uh, enormously, but it's expensive to develop because you need really system experts who really understand and who can actually glue things together. And then if you go to the far left, which is the most easiest part for people like you and me and other people who are writing sort of serverless applications, they're just like Lambda functions or they just uh, execute a big query or they just use Databricks SQL, they just send out a query and let Delta Lake and Lake House take care of it. And, and it scales automatically and, and, and it, it, it handles how much compute you actually need. The problem there is a very cloud specific. So if there are certain things that doesn't exist on the cloud, you are kind of beholden to, to that uh, limitations. They're stateless only. So if you actually have a Lambda function or if you have a big query, uh, if it's not maintaining a particular state, the server is gonna go away unless you have a third party uh, REST service to which you actually persist, then, then uh, you have to sort of write more code to it. And there might be no, you might not have all the GPUs and TPUs and the hardware and accelerators you actually need. So there are some there are some limitations of it. So you can actually think of the existing solutions are between this particular trade-off. So <clears throat> How does Ray actually fit in to address these particular demands? And I think I think the ethos and the principle behind behind Ray's vision was that we want to make distributed computing simple. We want to actually make it uh, uh, accessible to every developer. In other words, they really don't have to be a system experts that can actually just write Python functions and Python classes as if they were writing that. Uh, writing Python code and by using some of the design patterns that I'm going to talk about momentarily, change their code into an existing or distributed system. And that's sort of the key is that let's actually take that and make things easier. So how does how does Ray do that, right? So as I said, I'm going to start with a high, at, at the very high level. If you look at Ray, you can think of it as a layered cake, right? It's a layered cake of functionality and capabilities. Right at the bottom, you got all the cloud on which Ray can run, right? You can actually run it on AWS, any of the cloud providers, including your laptop, which is actually brilliant because now you can actually just develop things on your laptop, or you can run on, 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 on prems or on any hardware. If you go up on the, on the stack, you have the essential universal framework, which is the core of Ray, what we call the, the general purpose distributed computing. 
And the philosophical tenet behind that, the, the, the premise, the, 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 the axiom behind this is that Ray is general purpose computing. It, it doesn't deal with any specific workflow. It doesn't have a certain abstraction on which you actually build the APIs. Instead, it gives you this low level primitives, such as tasks, actors, which I talk about, which you can actually write to build any specific purpose workload that you actually want to deal with. And that's the essence of the Ray, which is that, you know, we're going to take care of all the elasticity, all the fault tolerance, all the, the, the compute substrata, and you can build things on top of that and we'll give you the primitives to do that. Think of it as like Unix operating system where the, 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 the guys at Bell Labs, you know, 20 or 30, 40 years ago actually just gave you the, the, the basic APIs to build things on top of that. You build an API to write a device driver, you build an API to do window manager, you write APIs to do distributed computing, you fork and exit all that, and then you build things on top of that. Very similar notion where you actually are given certain APIs and you build things on top of that. And then when you go a, a layer up is where the native libraries campaign. And the native libraries are using these APIs to actually um, handle specific workloads. So if you actually wanted to do distributed training, you use Ray Train. If you actually wanted to do reinforcement learning, use Erlib. If you actually want to scale models using um, um, uh, 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 Ray, so if you want to tune your parameters, uh, you can actually use hyperparameter tuning. So those are the native libraries which are very well built on top of that. Along the along the right hand side in the middle, you have all these third party integrations who actually have different levels of of integration with Ray. There's level one, two, and three. And each of these have various ways to integrate with Ray. And all of them are actually using these primitives to plug into Ray in order to scale those things. And then finally, if you are a distributed computer programmer who actually wants to build your own distributed framework that actually has nothing to do with machine learning, has got nothing to do with, with any of those stuff, you just want to write your Python application in a distributed manner, you can actually use those API and run that. So that's sort of sort of a layer uh, of, of what, what Ray is actually at that, at from, from 20,000 feet. And the, and the ecosystem is where the power of Ray actually lies, where it actually now handles <clears throat> the specific deep learning, the ML workloads that you actually need to do these machine learning models at massive scale, right? So the batteries are sort of included. If you're actually doing data processing, you can actually use data core and data sets. You can use modern if you actually want to do pandas on, <clears throat> on a distributed fashion. You can use Dask on Ray. Um, a lot of people actually do that. If you are using Spacey, if you're using Tensor, uh, uh, Tensor Library to do massive calculation, you can use Mars on Ray that allows you to do those things in a distributed manner. If you're training, right, deep learning training, you can use PyTorch, TensorFlow, or Horobot as a plugin along with this particular library to do that. Serving is another one that you can actually use once your models are trained and deployed, you can actually use Ray Serve to deploy those models. And Ray Serve allows you to build these pipelines, allows you to have all these different patterns that you actually see how ML uh, models are, are deployed in production. And finally, we, uh, 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 a very common workload is hyperparameter tuning, right? It, it integrates away with Hyperopt uh, or Optuna, whatever search algorithm you want to use, whatever schedules you want to use, you can use hyperparameter tuning to distribute your trials. And then finally, if you are a gamer or if you are doing simulations, if you're doing rec system, you can actually use RLib to build simulation models uh, to, to do your that particular workload. So that's fairly a rich ecosystem. And then more and more people actually sort of building things on top of these primitives to actually have their own integration with Ray. So that's at, at a very high level. And who is using Ray? <clears throat> I mean, I have to have this uh, imperative slide. Uh, we actually have some notable companies who are using Ray at a massive scale. Amazon is actually using uh, Dask on Ray to do massive data, data uh, parallel processing to ingest data in their in, in their models. Dendra is using that uh, hyperparameter tuning. McKinsey, Alibaba, all these people are actually using Alibaba. Actually, Ant, Ant has got over two hundred thousand cores on which actually they run Ray at a massive scale. So these are the companies who are actually using um, all this different different ways of doing things. <clears throat> so just now I'm gonna switch the gears and I'm gonna um, sort of raise the curtain a little bit. To look behind the scenes, you know, what, what, what Ray looks like, right? What are the internals? You open the hood, you pop up the hood and, and then you'll see something. Now, this is a common architecture. If you come from say Spark, or if you come from Dask, or if you come from Hadoop many years ago, or HPC, 
the idea is is not very really dissimilar. You know, you have um, you have a worker nodes that actually have some processes which are actually running. Um, the only difference between the head node <clears throat> and the worker node is that you have an additional uh, worker process called driver, which, which can run anywhere. It just happens to be running on this one. And then you actually have what we call the global control store, which is like a, a global meta directory that keeps track of all the resources available, who is doing what. Uh, so that's like, you know, the brain of it. And then what you actually have is, is these Raylets, which are your distributed scheduling, right? So Raylets are like peer-to-peer -peer communication that actually tells you what am I doing, what my resources are, and they're responsible to create your worker processes. So every worker has, has one process that's actually running, which is tied to a core. And then you have a distributed object store, which is runs on shared memory. And objects are sort of shared across the global customer. They are, they, they, they are either passed over when, when, when the task needs that. So this is something quite unique to Ray. Nobody actually uses this. And because of the distributed scheduling and because of the object store, we can actually scale that very easily. We can say hundreds and thousands of tasks are running asynchronously and using these stores. So if you actually have worker processes that need something uh, on, on a particular node um, and the other, other processes who have created data on that, you can actually use shared memory to do zero copy. That's quite actually unique. So let me just go one level below and, and sort of share with you what's happening at each and every node. So as I say, each and every node has these worker processes and the worker processes are, are um, um, uh, attached to a core. So if you have 12 cores, you'll have 12 worker processes. And the Raylet is the one that actually communicates. So whenever you actually want to schedule a particular job, the Raylet is the one who would say, oh, do I have the resources to have, you know, four GPUs that I need and this much memory I need? So yes, I'm going to take that and I'm going to run that particular task. And he communicates all the resources that you have uh, to the global store. And the, the global meta store then broadcast um, the, the, the picture, the mental picture of every 10, every 10 milliseconds, what the cluster actually looks like. So there's one Rayleigh per node and it actually is responsible sort of coordinating all that. And that's sort of the distributed nature of it. And global store is the key value store where currently we use Redis, but you can actually use any pluggable that you want. And there's a process that runs on top of that that manages and communicates with that. So that's sort of, um, so behind the scenes of actually what happens. So let me go now <clears throat> all the way down to sort of a, a little bit low level, the distributed design patterns that actually exist. Now, design patterns are not something new in our consciousness. You know, most of the software developers uh, probably have read that or heard that uh, book or they, they swear by that particular book from the Gang of Four. And those were the design patterns that were sort of introduced when object-oriented programming actually came into being and allowed us to, you know, reuse objects and they introduced concepts like signal turns and design patterns like uh, decorators and, and, and iterators and coroutines and so on and so forth. And so this, this is not something new. And so what Ray does, it use, builds on these particular design patterns to introduce its own design patterns. And there are sort of three design patterns associated with Ray. One is, and there are many design patterns, obviously, but these are the three ones that sort of introduces the concept of Ray. One is that all your functions can be converted into what we call parallel Ray tasks that actually run as a units of execution on, on Ray. And these can be distributed anywhere in the cluster. And any worker or any driver, or any worker can be a driver that actually executes that. So there's no central place where a driver dictates everything, right? Uh, uh, any worker can, can submit task. The second is that um, object stores or Ray objects are futures, right? They're object references to something that, that will return to you when the particular task is finished. So if the Python creates an object or Python returns the object, you won't get that object right away. What you'll get is a handle, is a future. So those of you who uh, deal with uh, Scala futures or Python futures, it's a reference that you can actually ask at the future. And these are immutable stored in the object store, right? The, the, the shared memory. And the third one are actors. And if you are not familiar with actors, these are actors that you might have heard in Arca or Erlang. Uh, but the difference between them is that these actors are very stateful and they use the object store to maintain a particular state. And this is, the Ray actors are a fundamental design pattern that you actually see being used in all the native libraries. And we'll, we'll, we'll see in a bit uh, what I mean by that. So these are stateful services that actually allow you to maintain a particular state of a particular 
machine learning algorithm that you're actually running. So especially when you're doing great tuning or when you're training parameters, you're running trials, the actors are running the trial, they're keeping state of that. So if something goes wrong, they can actually begin from where they left off. Now there are links over here about, you know, patterns of parallel programming, raised design patterns. These are just three, but there are about, you know, six or seven of them, which are more advanced for people who actually want to write distributed applications at massive scale. And there is the design pattern for how libraries are integrated. I mentioned about the third part libraries and they have different levels of integration, level one, level one, two, and three. So if you're interested to integrate your library into Ray, you follow those design pattern and you can seamlessly integrate with Ray at these three different levels. And each of them are, are there's a degree of, of difficulty or degree of ease. So let's look at the design pattern. Function, as I said, can, can, be, can be converted into tasks. They can run anywhere on the node. A class can be converted into a stateful actor and the actor can have design and methods can actually run on a node. And then you have the distributed object store where your object can be now become a reference, which can reside anywhere in the node. And there is this notion of primary ownership of, of, of a node. So any function that's being scheduled on a node A if it creates a particular value and returns a value, that particular node will own the metadata for that. So that's actually a primary copy. So that, that node will own that particular data. And if another task is scheduled somewhere else, and if that task needs it, then that will be sort of copied over using you know, G, uh, GSP RPC. So that sort of is, is uh, the three design patterns. So let's look at some code, right? So I have a function that I want to convert into a task. All you do is just annotate that particular function with, with ray.remote. And now this is going to be converted into a distributed task. Um, I have the two functions, one reads two NumPy arrays, uh, and then just adds them together. And then when you want to invoke those things, all you do is use the name of the function and then just annotate with a dot remote and then pass the argument. And what happens at this point is that it's going to be scheduled somewhere on the node and it returns right away asynchronously, which is the power of that, right? Because that way you can actually scale a lot of tasks. It returns you an ID reference, and then you can actually use the second function to call the second file. And then you can just use those references to send it out to a third function called remote. And then you can just do a get, right? So all these are known blocking calls. The only, the only call that's gonna block is, is, is the last one. So we here in node array one, we'll have file one that's actually sent um, or, or a path and it's gonna read that either from the GC store or from AWS or if it's, if it's, if it's on a local file system where you have already populated that, then it's gonna read that. And remember, it's gonna create the graph dynamically. The second one will be scheduled on node two. It's gonna read that particular file. Now you're gonna send it to add remote it's going to create a, create a graph and then return you the task right away. And then when you actually do a get, those are running in the background. If they're finished, uh, this won't block very easily. But if they're wrong, long running task, they'll wait till 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 it gets finished, and and it'll return back. So that's essentially what what sort of happens behind the scenes with, with the task API, and and the notion of of this is is that. Uh, we want to run things dynamically um, and asynchronously because we don't want to wait in the order synchronously as other, other distributed systems do, where we actually wait till an action is invoked or a sudden ex a call is executed, then it, it, it sort of executes the particular graph. Over here, things happen dynamically. And the reason it's important dynamically is because in certain machine learning algorithms, where you're deciding how you're going to dynamically create the next task, you have to know exactly what the result was from the previous task. So that way it, it executes things eagerly rather than lazily. Um, the notion I want to talk about is distributed uh, object store. As I say, this is something quite unique to it. We have a shared memory that runs across the uh, across the 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 older workers, and you can think of a shared memory is is an Apache Spark an Apache Plasma store, which is the 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 Pi Arrow uh, version of of the the Plasma store, and that actually is shared across all the nodes. So now, if you have worker processes running on the particular node and they need some data that other processes create, you just do a zero copy. Like right? so if you have NumPy array or if you have tensors which are which you have saved. Process A can just read the pointer and that way it's, they are not doing any IPC. So the, the performance is very high. If somehow your data doesn't fill up on the shared memory store, it can always be spilled over the data. And all that tracking is actually done by, by, by the metadata to say, okay, this store was, was over here, but it has been, has been spilled over to the disk in this particular partition, this particular sector. So if you need that particular data, 
load it back in again. And if there's old memory sitting there, it'll be garbage collected. So this is all done behind the scenes. You don't have to worry, but I thought I would share that with you as an important aspect of it. And so here's an example of how the data locality work. I have a distributed immutable object. I have node one that actually is executing a task. It returns a value X. I have another function called G, which actually gets a value. It's going to return Y. When I do F dot remote, it's going to be scheduled on node two, let's say, uh, for, 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 for argument. And then I'm sending G remote, the object reference that will return to be right away. And what happens is now G is going to be scheduled because of the data locality on node two, and it's going to just read the data from the shared memory and then return back the value of, of, of G. And then I can just do, do, do the get on that and now I actually have the value. So you can actually see how, how the object store comes into being and how asynchronicity of the task being executed in parallel allows people to just run you know, things at a massive scale. So just to give you an idea how things work, for example, you know, I have a ray that remote that, that is going to be scheduled somewhere the way it actually works. Now, again, over here, I'm showing you driver, but any worker can actually execute that. Just, it just happens that my code is not running on driver. So it's going to ask this local ray that, hey, I need... I need, I, I need to schedule this task. This task needs you know, five CPUs or, or one, one CPU. Um, do you actually have resources for that? It will, give, it will give it a list to it and say, yeah, I, 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 I have it and, and go ahead and execute it. And that particular driver would serialize the, the, the code. And now the, the worker is actually ex executing. If the worker actually has, if the code within, within double is calling another function, driver is not involved in there. Now, now the worker is the one who is going to now submit the task with another node, right? He would say, oh, I need a GPU, but I don't have that. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the rail, do you actually have the resource to do that? I don't have, but you know, uh, node number three has it. It gets the list for it and holds on the list to execute very similar tasks. So that's how we actually sort of scale. This is sort of just an algorithm, the way it actually goes through getting a list and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to belabor you guys with how uh, the leases are sort of scheduled so that we don't we don't do this a constant grpc so then once i have the lease i can have thousands of, of, of tasks which are of similar type need similar resources can be scheduled on that particular machine and if they have 16 cores they'll run on that if they have 32 cores they'll run on that if they run out of scope they'll be scheduled on on, on the second node so all that actually happens dynamically all these scheduling policies are done dynamically and you wouldn't have to worry about that so I think this is this is sort of now now at the sea level. What I want to talk about before I actually, you know, it's a good idea before I go into see if I uh, if there are any um, questions over here. Okay, maybe we'll just hold on to the end. Brilliant. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is the Ray ecosystem, and I, and like I said, I can't talk about all the libraries given the time that we actually have. So what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about two. I might. Skipo XGBoost Ray, because when I do the demo, I'll talk about exactly what XGBoost Day rose under the scene. But I want to talk about Ray Tune because if you're a data scientist and if you're ML, tuning is a very important aspect of machine learning workload. You normally do that. You know, you're going to create your baseline, and then after that, you're going to use hyperparameter tuning to actually do that. And then Tune is a very flexible, powerful library in Ray that allows you to do that at a massive scale across the cluster. So let's take a look at that. So what is Raytune, right? Um, very simple library, um, supports state-of-the-art algorithms from the most latest literature that allows you to run trials in parallel. Um, it, the, because it runs on Ray, all the orchestration, all the distributed orchestration of your trials for the config space are done in parallel. So that you know, sort of leaves you the burden of, of, of doing that in sequential manner. You know, each, each worker or each Ray uh, will, actor will get a, a, a slice of the, of the config space and you will actually have, have your trial and it will, it will go through the, the, the motor training to do your hyperparameter tuning. It's easy to use in APIs. So the, the all important thing is that you just use tune, you have your training function and you just run train model. And you can run these on a single process, right? That can use all the cores if you actually want, or you can actually use multiple GPUs on the same machine, or if you actually want to use multi-node, multi-cluster, you can actually use that as well. So it's very simple. It integrates very uh, easily with all the compatible 
uh, machine learning libraries that you actually have, which are very essential to do hyperparameter tuning, so XeBoostRay, scikit-learn, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, you name it. All those libraries are available for you to do that. The good thing about, about this is there's this notion in, in Ray libraries that you can have other libraries run as a subroutine. So my training model could be a PyTorch function, which is actually another library, right? But I'm running that within Ray. And that's a powerful notion that, 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 that you have to grasp that. And then it's very interoperable with all the other ones. So I can, if I'm using Ray Tune, I can use Ray Train uh, to convert uh, my to do distributed training. I can use Ray data sets to have my sharded data across all the workers that my hyperparameter tuning will need to, to do things in parallel. So it's actually quite powerful. And just to give you a quick sort of um, rundown of all the state of the art search algorithms that today Ray tune supports, you know, by default, you, you will do the random grid search. Uh, you got Bayesian uh, bandit optimization. So these are all very easy um, built-in algorithms that we actually support. And in order for to use them, when you actually, when you're creating a Ray tune, uh, the object, the library, you just, just create an instance of a search algorithm you actually need. And it's gonna use that search algorithm with this hyperopt, whether it's Optuna, we support that, or it, it's integrated with Ray, and then you will actually use that to search through your hyperspace. You can, actually, you can also use schedulers, right? So schedulers are the ones that, that, that schedule the trials based on certain policies that you might have. So you can use ASHA for hyperparameter uh, scheduling, halving algorithm that, that schedules only things that are doing well and other, other things are dropped. You can use hyper, hyperband, you can use all these population-based training schedulers with Ray Tune to be able to tune things on massive scale. And if you're new to you know, hyperparameters, if you're new to hyper HPO, what does it actually mean to, to hyperparameter? What does it actually mean to, to do tuning for those of you who are, who are new? And I'm sure for those of you who are familiar with that, this is just a, a sort of easy thing. So you know, there are two kinds of parameters, right? They are, they are the modal parameters which you actually learn during the time when you're actually running trials. And these are the weights, these are the biases, these are all the things in, in, in a linear uh, regression model, that's what it would be. In the network, this will be the parameters for your weights that, that are passed between each and layers. And hyperparameters are set before training, and they sort of determine how the learning parameter will actually fare. And these could be, you know, learning rate could be related to your pipeline configurations, how you actually want each and every learning rate across your, your let's say, scikit learn. Uh, the number of trees, if you're using a tree-based algorithm, the depth, how often you're going to, 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 uh, to do the random. So these are the things that, that sort of define your hyperparameter. And here's, here's another example of hyperparameter tuning, where if, you, if you're tuning, a, a particular network, you know, what kinds of layer, what kind of filters you use, you know, what's going to be your max pooling, how many dense layers you can have. These are the parameters you can ask your, your, your training algorithm to, to figure out given the space that you actually have, and it'll come up with the best optimal algorithm based on the uh, maximum or minimum loss that you actually want. So that's sort of um, um, the gist of what, what parameter. Now there's some challenges, you know, when you're doing hyperparameter tuning on a massive scale, this can take, you know, uh, from, from, from minutes to hours to, to, to days. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that it is time consuming because you have a large hyperparameter space and you want to have the best model and it can be actually costly too. And some of the challenges are here to make sure that it is going to use the resources in a more optimal way. And it has to be elastic, it has to be full tolerant. So you might be doing your HPO on about five hours and all of a sudden one of the servers goes down, what happens then? You have to start the job all over again? No, you don't have to. So I think these are the hyperparameter the challenges that you have to deal with. And sort of Ray tries to address those, Ray Tune in particular, tries to address those in three ways, right? You can actually do an exhaustive search and keep on, keep on going till, till, till you find the best one. Or you can use sort of more Bayesian optimization where you only pick up the results from the previous one in a sequential manner. So now you can say, okay, I'm gonna drop this one, but I'll use this one because the, the previous trial was, was a better result and I'll do that. Or you can do advanced scheduling like Asha does that or other more uh, state-of-the-art algorithms that have certain policies that, that do, for example, early stopping or halving algorithm that all will only um, go forward if there is a promising trial that actually runs. So if you look at each of these, you know, 
You can do exhaustive search. It's very easily parallelizable because it's easy to implement. You just have a certain grid and you can parallelize that, right? And you exhaustively go through that. And random search is the same way you uniformly go across your, your parameter sweep and you do that. But it's very inefficient, right? Because you don't know, right? We don't, we, we don't keep track of, of what was the, the, the grid parameter from the previous one should actually now use that combination. So it's inefficient. But the, today, the literature now is actually changing, whereby they are doing using more more efficient algorithms to actually parallelize that. So you can use, for example, results from the previous one in order to decide what you're going to be doing next. Um, Bayesian optimization is another one. If you look at this particular chart, if you if you use Bayesian optimization very tuned, it will try to figure out what's the best minimum loss that I have, and I'll, I'll sort of create a particular space around which all the other configs, if they fall into that, then I'm gonna go with that. The rest of the configurations, I won't, I'll, I'll toss it out. So that's sort of a good way to do that. It's inherently sequential because you, the Bayesian optimization depends on the previous trials results to see whether I want to schedule similar uh, config parameter of my next trial, or I just wanna toss it out and put it on the, on the red zone. So the ones in the blue zones are the ones who fall into that and, and do that. These libraries, uh, Raytune is integrated with HyperOp. So if you are familiar with HyperOp, you wanna use that. Like I say, you just create a hyperparameter search and you use that and boom, Ray will take care of that. Optuma, Scikit Optimize is the new one that, have that has been has been integrated and never grad is another one. So that's sort of second way how you can actually reduce the cost to do that. The third one that the Ray Tune actually uses, which is early stop. And so what it does, it will fan out all this initial exploration to your config space, and it will just use the intermediate results, whether it's from the trees or from the samples, and it will prune dynamically as it actually goes in. So it will start with massively, and the one, the, the trials which are not faring well, they use the halving algorithm to actually stop those early stopping. So this sort of reduces the cost, right? It doesn't wait till exhaustively it reaches that. As soon as it sees after a few rungs that the loss is not changing or nothing is changing, it's gonna drop that and then it'll pick up the next one. As you can actually see as, as it time progressive, the ones which are doing better, it will start continuing along with those. So those are some of the, you know, the, some of the, the, the strategies and, and the policies that Raytune actually uses. And just to give you a sample of the code, how easy it is for you to use Raytune, very simple step. This is like your, your, your PyTorch function that, that you actually create like a training function. You define that particular function, you create a particular model, you're gonna have an epochs that you're gonna go through. Uh, that's your early function. You define your training function, you give it to tune, right? So tune.run is the one that's going to take that particular function. And now you're gonna provide the uniform config space that you actually want, the number of samples you want, the number of trials you actually want, uh, like number of epochs in this case. And then what schedule you wanna use, right? You wanna use Asha to do early stopping so you can actually use halving algorithm to make better decisions for the next trial. Uh, what search algorithm you wanna use? You wanna use Optuna and you just specify that. And then uh, when, you, when you say do you run dot tune, what happens at this point is that now your driver process where your driver is running is going to create this function called ray tune dot run. That's, that's the, 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 the main actor or main tracker. And it's going to launch these actors on what we call worker processes. And each actor will have a copy of your serialized function and will have a slice of your configuration and it's gonna run in parallel. And what it will do is report metrics back after the trial is finished, so then it, the, the, the tracker can say, okay, what, what, what is the next one that I want to orchestrate? Or should I just drop that? Or is early stopping and I'm not going doing very well? Or should I just house it? And things of that sort. So report metrics go back. It's, if there's an early stop, it's going to stop that particular worker and then we'll launch a new trial with a new configuration. This sort of goes on. If something goes wrong, you know, we do checkpoint on periodically. Uh, trials checkpoints can be done on local directory or it can be done on a central place in the cloud. So if the worker goes down, we can actually just load the checkpoint and start restoring from the last checkpoint and start training. So you don't, you know, you don't train all the data, you just train from the last checkpoint and you go on. So that sort of in essence is, is, is what Ray Train, what uh, XGBoost actually does. Let me pause here and see if there is um, any questions there. Excellent. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pause now here. I'm going to, I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip over the, uh, 
the Exibus Ray because um, I'll talk through that when I'm actually going to give a demo to some of the design features, but just at a very high level. Um, Just at a very high level, you know, the, the Exiboost is really a distributed uh, training, right? There is, there is the Exiboost, which you can use distributed on your single machine, on the single cores. But this is the Exiboost Ray that actually allows you to take your training and do it across, uh, across multiple cores. So it's like a data parallel. Actually, you, each, each, each um, um, worker will get a copy of the particular model and it will use that on, on a section of the data. It's very full tolerant um, because it, it uses that. So I'm, I've lived these links over here and I'll get that. I really don't want to get into it because I want, you know, I want to sort of show you how you actually scale those things on, on a particular cluster. So let's, uh, let's do this and, and go to my demo. Can you guys can see? Is the um, yep, it looks is, good? It looks good. Okay. Yep. So what I'm going to show you over here is that in your sort of journey every day, um, when you're building a particular model on your laptop, or eventually then you're going to you're going to use the the cluster that you have, uh, you're going to be using three very common workloads that you're going to scale. You want to train. One is training. Uh, which you actually want to train um, in, 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 at scale with large amounts of data. The second workload, which is very common in your daily to radio process about model building is hyperparameter tuning, which is, you know, how do you actually get the best model, right? You create a baseline, but then you have config space or which you want to do hyperparameter tuning. And then the, th and the third one is inference. You know, once you actually have the model for which you have got the best model, how do you actually do inference on that at a particular scale? And so, the idea over here is that we'll try to do something on, on, on our local machine that has a limited capacity and has a limited number of cores. And we'll see that the, the amount of time it actually takes is enormous. And then we can just scale it uh, across uh, a rare cluster uh, and, and see how it actually fares time-wise. So those are sort of the, the, the three things I wanna do. So what I'm doing over here is I'm just uh, a regular uh, classification algorithm that I'm going to uh, use Exibus uh, to, to train that classification algorithm and just regular imports, uh, no different. I have about a 10 million, 10 million rows that, that I'm classifying across, about 40 different features and the two classes that I do want to um, do that. And this code is just a code that actually reads, reads three reads the file and then shards it across using Ray data set to have it across my cluster. And I have three sets of files because I want to use, you know, three different ways that I can test that 300 megabyte, uh, three gigabyte and 11 gigabyte files, All right? So let's look at each of these. So first what we're going to do is we're going to train using regular XGBoost, right? So when you use your regular XGBoost, this is your training function you would actually use using XGBoost, uh, no different, All right? What you're going to do use over here is you define your XGBoost parameters that you are gonna give it to your, your, your Exibut trainer. Uh, my objective method is approximation. I'm using objective logistic, um, uh, uh, logistic classification by evaluation actually is gonna be loss and error. I import my Exiboost and I'm gonna import my D matrix train and the function called train. Very, very generic Exiboost train uh, function that you're actually gonna use. All this is all part of the Exiboost. You're going to have your labels, you're going to read, load the parquet files, um, divide them into 75, 25. Uh, you're going to then convert them into the D matrix, which is the efficient version of how, how XGBoost Ray puts that in a data structure. Uh, you're going to create your training function in why you, 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 you set the parameters, you set the evaluations that you actually want, the results you actually want back whether you want verbose not, and then you want uh, uh, the 10 rounds uh, that you actually want to train over. And then these are just some callbacks you actually have. Very standard stuff that you would actually normally use. So let's see if this function actually works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and make sure the function works on, on, a, on a small data set, which is about 300 megabyte, right? So I'll just go ahead and train my particular model. This is running on my uh, on, on, on Jupyter on, on a local node that has about 16 cores. And you can see, okay, this actually works, 300 megabyte, no problem. Then I'm gonna do is see if I can actually try that on a largest data set, which is three, three gigabyte. Now I'm not gonna run it because, you know, this is gonna take about four minutes. So I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna show, I just ran this just before that. You can see that when I ran XGBoost on a local machine with three giga, only three gigabyte file, it took about three minutes or, or, or yeah, close to, close to um, um, two and a half. 
right? Instead, what about if I use XG boost to array? And the way XG boost to array works is that it has this notion where, remember I told you that the way the, the actors work, you have a tracker, which, is, which, which actually creates the number of actors you actually want. Each worker will get an associate actor on which it will run. It will have, a sh it will, it will have the, the data for it, for, 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 for it to run on. And all these actors communicate uh, across each other using the tree-based reduced algorithm called Rabbit. That's how they, they, they uh, synchronize the gradients. And then they return back to the tracker. So this is how XGBoost X -Boost on Ray works, which is drop and replacement from using, using the normal Ray, but now you're actually running in a distributed fashion across the cluster rather than on, on, on the same node. So everything is actually the same, exactly the same. I'm providing my XGBoost parameters, same, same parameters. The only thing I'm changing over here is I'm importing XGBoost Ray from XGBoost Ray. The Ray data, the Ray D matrix version of the D, of the D matrix, which is the, 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 the way it actually efficiently stores the, 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 the data. I'm gonna import the train algorithm, the train function and the Ray parameters, which are what it is. And it's actually the same function. The only difference over here is that I'm now using the same, same code, same, same um, data, but I'm using Ray D matrix, which will now distribute across my workers. And then I'm providing the same argument, except the difference over here is that I'm having this additional parameter called Ray params. And I'll talk about what these Ray params are in a minute. So we're gonna do that. And we're gonna define the parallelism that I want. So it's exactly the same code I executed above, except that now I have, I'm using the XGBoot parameters, which I sent. The data files is the same three gigabyte file. And now I'm telling Array uh, to, to use eight actors, eight, eight actors or eight workers on each machine and use 16 CPUs on that, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and train that. Um, so let's see if this, this works. So now this is actually running on my Ray cluster that I created on any scale. And you can actually see it uses the rings to do the, do the uh, all, all map reduce to, to, to communicate with the, with, with, the, with the gradients. And it's now actually running on this all eight different nodes using all the, all the GPUs that I provided. So this was actually done in about 13 seconds. So this was about well, three times faster uh, than running on my, on my local host, on my uh, local, local node. So that's sort of uh, the Ray train, uh, XGBoost Ray, you can run, run it on, on, on the node with a small data set to, do, to see if it works, and then you train it on a larger data set to do that. So that you can actually see the big difference between running it on, on a local node and running it across the cluster. In Ray, when you actually parallelize those using, using Ray, and it took about 13 seconds, which was you know, um, faster than the, much faster than the, the one on the local node. The second um, workload that people normally uh, do a lot repeatedly when you're building model uh, at scale is hyperparameter tuning. And the hyperparameter tuning again is, is, is very much um, sort of built in where you can actually use actually boost your training function in there to scale it out. So here I have uh, pretty much the same XGBoot config. I'm using binary loss. Uh, then I'm providing my hyperparameter tuning using this is my uh, ETA learning rate to be uniform from you know from one from from from, from the parameters that I provide uh, the sample the depth that I want from one to nine and then I and then I suggest how I actually want to parallelize that so I want to have I don't have any GPUs so I'm just going to use uh, no actors I'm going to use two GPUs per actor I'm going to have eight actors which are going to run across my node and then I'm just going to give it to tune tune dot run and, and then provide my uh, train XG boost uh, function, the files that I want, which are three gigabyte, the rare parameters that I want and the progress bar. And I start running this particular in parallel. And this is what happens over here is now it's gonna go out and create eight actors and start using, so you can actually see over here, it's actually using 136 GPUs. And, and 14 G, of, of all the 100, 144 G, CPUs that I have. And it's now it's actually doing training across my hyperparameter states in parallel. So I have eight actors, each get, gets a copy a slice of that config parameter and it just keeps on going and training. And at some point um, it's going to <clears throat> terminate. So right now I'm running eight, eight trials in parallel. Uh, this is my last trial's best parameter. 
and currently I should have about, yeah, one is terminated, I have seven running. You see now it's actually 100, we're using 119 CPUs, dropped down to 85 because I have three ones which are terminated. Terminated doesn't mean it's stopped terminated, means it's finished the trial and it got its results. And this was done, um, there I got five more running. So what's actually happening over here is, as I say, uh, this is exactly what's happening over here. So now you've got a trial which are running in parallel by the actors and they're reporting metrics back to see how, how each, 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 each of these uh, metrics are actually doing. And based on that, the second trial is actually launched. So we have about five, <clears throat> uh, seven terminated, one running. And you can, you, you can see it's now it's actually just using 17 CPUs to finish the last one. And it's terminated in about 82 seconds. If I ran this on my on my laptop or on my single node on the head node, this would take you know uh, considerably longer than that. So hyperparameter tuning is something that that you use quite often, uh, and, and to scale that, you can actually use ray tune on a ray cluster to to give you this best parameter. And this is my best approximation of my my parameter. My ETA is 0 0.15. Uh, subsample was five. The BEX number of maximum depth three was three. So the third, uh, how much time we have? Okay, so the third and the final uh, training that most people actually do workload is inference, right? You actually want to do inference at a massive scale. So now you train the model, you got your best parameters uh, optimization, you're going to train this particular model and now you want to do the inference to see how it actually fares. So let's first try to do that on, on, on a single machine. Uh, using pretty much the same model with the predict, but except that over here, over here we actually not we are, we are not sending uh, we are not distributing it. We're just using the D matrix uh, part of it, and let's run that. So this is going to take about you know ninety seconds, I believe, uh, to do that. So what's happening? What's happening over here is that it's actually getting is going through the the three gigabytes of file and it's actually doing prediction on each of those and it's doing it sort of in a, in a sequential manner on on a single node and it's actually going through this particular data well, this is running let me just check okay so um we got about seven gigabytes, so we probably got another three, three more to go. So as you can actually see, it's sort of really churning really hard. It's not taking care. It's not. It's not really capitalizing on the fact that I have a ray cluster and I can do inference in in, in parallel um, rather than doing in sequential. So we're almost there, and this is going to take about maybe a few more seconds, but we should be done with that. So we went through all, all of the 11 gigabytes and this should actually give us a timing how it actually took to, 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 get, the, to get the results. So it took about you know, 81 seconds, um, a little, uh, a minute and a half or so. And let's look at the results uh, of our inference and that's what our classification algorithm returned. Now we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna do the same thing on X equals Ray. And you see the only difference over here is that now I'm using the RD matrix to get my inference data parameters and then the only thing I'm sending which is different from the previous one is I'm saying use nine actors to do inference in parallel. So this is gonna now run in parallel where I am now created eight remote actors and I'm just doing inference in parallel and that should just return almost immediately. And that took about nine seconds, so about 10 times faster. So you can actually see the difference, how you can actually scale things locally and, and scale things remotely. One of the great things about, about, uh, about Ray is that you really can sort of use your laptop for experimentation. And then when you want to something, when you want to want something running on the, on the cluster, you just connect to the cluster using, using Ray in it and, and it, it, it connects it very well. So those are my results. You can see they're quite identical. So I have some, you know, notebooks over here that that, that um, uh, go more deeper into this. But this is a very common workload that people will actually do. And Ray Tune is one of the libraries that allows you to do that hyperparameter at scale. It works very well with other libraries. I don't have to use XGBoost if I wanted to use PyTorch. My training function over here now would be a PyTorch function. And my model over here would be a convolution net that I actually have. And my training function then would be just given to the ray train 
to go ahead and do that. And if I have a hyperparameter space that I have provided, then I want you know my my dense layer to be the, uh, to be to, to be within that particular range. My filters to be that kind. My connected net to be this set, and it will just figure out what's the best what's the best parameter over the particular space. So it's quite powerful. It's 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 it's, it's enormous in terms of uh, the benefits that you actually get and the time it saves and the cost it saves. So I think that's. That's essentially what I had in terms of the um, um, the demo. Uh, what I'm going to do, let me just go back to my slides over here quickly before I end. Oh, so yeah, I mean, here's an example you actually saw where, where I'm using the simple API example to use my XGBoost array um, uh, without, without the array. And the only thing I, I changed over here, I did the import, um, imported array, array D matrix, XGBoost array, the parameters that I, the, 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 the parallelism that I want and the training function from, from Ray. And I just changed this particular line, that's it. And I just use Ray train to send those parameters. And now I have my training function running in a distributed manner. That's only three or four lines of code you have to change, taking your existing actually boost array and then convert that into a parallel parallel code. So that was it. Takeaways are, you know, distributed computing is going to be a necessity. You know, we have to accept it now today. Almost everything is, is a norm now. And Ray's vision is to actually make things a lot simpler. Uh, uh, make the APIs a lot simpler. That's sort of the ethos behind it, right? When I, I, I remember when I was when I was uh, early uh, when I joined Databricks you know, six years ago, very early. Our motto was that make big data simple. Over here, our motto is make you know make distributed computing simple, where you can just use your Python functions as if you're writing them on a Python file, and then use the remote decorators to do the distributed computing, and let Ray take care of the hard work. You don't have to be a systems expert; just use Ray Remote to do all your stuff. And uh, you know, scale your workload using the real libraries, and along with the ecosystem that provides you to do purpose-specific stuff. Um, we have those of you who actually are interested in reinforcement learning. We actually have a conference coming up in in about a month. Um, it's free and virtual. Uh, you can actually join. Here's the URL. Uh, when I send the slides, you will actually have the URL over here as well. And then, if you actually want to take this really uh, interesting tutorial about contextual bandwidths, you know, how to use offline learning using Relib from the creator and, and the maintainer, lead maintainer of RLib. Um, there's a 50, there's a discount there for you. Just use that meetup code uh, and you can actually get that. This is really a worthwhile because RLib now is a new thing that people are, people are using quite a bit. And if you want to start running, you know, learning about Ray, you know, just pip install Ray on your local machine and start start using that. We have copious amount of documentation. I'm putting a lot of code examples. I have tutorials on it as well. Uh, we have a meetup. We have started we revived after two years of COVID. We had our first meetup in January. We have another one coming up on March the second, uh, which deals with Ray Train, which is the new library for deep learning, which was released. And then on March 30th, I'm hosting the, the Ray Serve meetups. If you are interested in productionizing uh, models using Ray Serve, uh, attend that meetup. Uh, we have a, a vibrant community that actually has, has, has a lot of discussions going on. So join us and discuss that Ray. Uh, there's a Slack uh, for the community as well. Follow us on, on media and uh, visit us on GitHub and, and give us a star if you like. So I think thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with me, um, Jules at anyscale.com. Um, follow me on Twitter. I'll follow you. you know, I, I know it sounds dodgy, but I use that line all the time. And then, uh, yeah, connect me with LinkedIn. Tell me you attended my uh, presentation. So with that way, I know who you are. So that, in essence, was 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 a lot of stuff over here that I covered. Let me see if I have, if there are any questions that in the Q&A, there's some chat. And folks, if, if anyone has questions, uh, oh, Jules will answer uh, your questions right now. Yes. Now I think, yeah.
Oh, there's one question. Um, if I heard you correctly, internal communication is every 10 milliseconds if I want something within shorter. I think I, I, I could have misquoted it. I think it's a lot shorter than that. There is there is a configurable parameter, but I'll check with the Tom. I think I think 10 milliseconds is 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 it might be 100 milliseconds, but I'll check, right? I'll check that and I'll make sure that, that, that it is the right thing. Um, I think 10 milliseconds or something else where it actually checks the object object store um, uh, cache for eviction. But I think it's much so, the heartbeat is, is it's much smaller than that. But I'll, but I'll verify that. 10 milliseconds doesn't sound right. It, 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 is, it is much smaller than that. Okay, uh, let's see, do we actually have anything on chat? Anyone else have a question for Jules? You're gonna ask me why, why okay, I heard you heard like that. So, this is a former Spark meetup. You're probably not gonna ask me, well, why Spark? Why, why you're here? What's the difference? <laughs> Well, okay, here, I, I have a question for you, Jules. Um, yes. Can I integrate Ray with Spark? <laughs> good question. That's a, that's a very good question. But before I do that, let me just let me just share this slide with you because I think I just like this slide just especially for you, uh, uh, <laughs> <Great>. Dorothy. <laughs> because you. when I was giving the talk, you said, well, you know, we want to find out what's the difference between the two. And I think I think they're very, very complementary. Really, Spark and Ray are are extremely complementary. They they sort of, you know, um, Ray Spark finishes a certain point and Ray picks it up. But but just to give you a very high level sort of differences between between the two. Um, um, they are very complementary and, and they work well together. Uh, you can actually run Ray on Spark um, if you actually want to do ETL data processing. But just at a very general high level, I talked about the Ray is a very general distributed computing system. It's not specific addressing a particular load. It gives you these low level primitives, fine grained primitives to, to, to write any, any, any distributed application you want. So think of it, Ray is a, is a framework to write other frameworks. Right, think about that. Where if you go on the on the right hand side, you know, Spark is very powerful, very performant for specific purpose distributed um, uh, data loads. You know, it is built on top of a data 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 frame abstraction, right? And because of that, you actually have sort of more coarse grain APIs like DSL. So with data frame abstraction and the DSL, you actually tell Spark what to do, right? In other words, in other words, it's it's very coarse grained. Um, the other difference is that Ray is very distributed scheduler there is no single driver node that sort of controls everything right whereas if you look and and, and the graphs are, are computed dynamically and the reason you use a dynamic eager ex execution is because especially when you're dealing with sort of uh, machine learning uh, algorithms like training and tuning uh, you have to decide how you're actually going to schedule your next one and that's based on something that you just computed so it's a very eager eager execution it just executes right away graphs are created dynamically whereas spark has a static scheduler right i'm going to create my data frame list of methods and then i'm going to invoke uh, an action and when the action is done the entire deck gets executed the deck goes through the, the 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 logical abstract the logical optimization the physical optimization it creates a, a final rdd abstraction and then executes that right whereas over here everything is actually happening not that one is better than the other it's just that that's the nature of how spark was built on top of a, a, a data frame abstraction just like dask was built on the data frame abstraction for dask and bags uh, um, Ray doesn't have this notion of an abstraction, right? It gives you the primitives to build other things. We use distributed object store. Uh, in other words, you know, everything is actually shared across and it's very asynchronous. So we don't wait for synchronous. Whereas if you look at Spark, you know, when you actually create a, a transformations, you're going to create a, a list of action, a list of methods on your particular data frame, and those are going to be uh, executed sequentially. Uh, whereas over here, you just execute something and then you're going to get a reference back. And at some point you, uh, later on, you can actually ask whether I'm done with the task. Um, Ray is not there to displace any libraries. And we are, the, we are really here to integrate and interoperate very openly. So all the third parties libraries you see, it's not displacement, right? So if you actually wanted to do, for example, data processing, which is not, which is not necessarily today Ray's strength, you know, we, the Ray is not, not a data processing framework. It is sort of main 
for you can you can write your own data processing. You can use Dask and Ray. You can use Spark and Ray as well. And so the native libraries are there to sort of address those workloads. And it's very Pythonic in nature. In other words, if you look at the Ray code, uh, the way how other libraries are integrated, it is very similar. Obviously, we actually have PySpark over here, which has has, has few sort of Scala uh, uh, pullovers. Um, yes, Spark supports uh, deep learning integration through Horowood and PyTorch and TensorFlow, whereas over here, you can actually use, use this different levels of that. And uh, another question was that, well, how do, you, how do you use Spark with Ray? It's very simple. There's a project called Spark on Ray, and, and here's a very simple code of, of Spark running on Ray, right? And so all you do is you actually wrap your driver around this class called Spark, and that's going to be remote. And then when you do a, a, a Ray dot init, what you're actually creating is, is a Spark context and a Spark session. And then you're telling Ray Actor to create two Java executors, right? So it actually launches the executor. It's not... It's not doing all the communication. All the communication between MapReduce or between the executors is handled by, by underlining JVM, right? So all Ray is actually doing is launching this, this Java uh, JVMs on, on the actors. The actors are just managing that. And then, and then now you just do a, a driver part a remote and, and you can uh, execute a function called remote to do your partitioning, to do any, any transformation that you actually want. It is as, is as simple as that. You create a Spark session, you use Spark method to go ahead and do your transformation that you actually want. Uh, and then you just invoke the, the, the result by just using ray.get. So that's your, that's your answer to the question, Dorothy. A million, million, million dollar uh, answer to your question. Yeah, Jules, there's another question here about Ray data and sharding. Uh, let's see. Curious about Ray data and sharding. For example, currently shard using rank and how its size is introduced in Horowood defined shell. How would I do the same in Ray? Good question, right? So the Ray, so the so the Ray data sets is the new library, which is in which is in experimental that was released. Uh, we have had a couple of meetups and we actually have a webinar coming up uh, on the 23rd. But the whole idea behind Ray, Ray data is to provide, it's not a replacement for data frame. Please don't get that wrong. Ray data is there to provide last minute transformation from your, from your, um, uh, from your parquet files when you're injecting things into, into your training function. So when you actually want to shard your data across all the workers, what you do is you check your array data set that you actually read that set from an S3 bucket and parquet file and you repartition it based on the number of cores that you have or number of ray actors that you're actually going to give that. And that's how you actually sort of shard it across that. That's what that's what Ray Databricks, Ray D matrix did in my demo, where when I say read D matrix, it read that particular parquet file and then it uses the it uses the 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 um, shared memory to put the stuff in it, and then now my Ray workers, which are running training, could actually access to that. The Horowood aspect, the Horowood aspect of that is the way Horowood and TensorFlow and, and PyTorch are in, integrated with Ray Train is what we call level one integration, where the level one integration is that Ray does not handle the low level communication. Ray only handle, handle, handles the, ex, the, the, the launching of the worker processes and the internal communication, whatever the internal communication, whether it's Horowat or whether it's DDP that's using PyTorch or whether it's using TensorFlow is the one that actually does the communication, right? So we don't do that. We just, we just use the backend to do that. And then Ray data integration is just a way to, to, to take your parquet file and convert that into, into let's say TF records or convert that into a Dask data frame or convert that into a Spark data frame or convert that into a data into a Pandas data frame if you actually wanted to use some sort of transformation. So the data, data Ray data set is the last glue. Uh, I can think of it, another way to put it, I can think of it is that where, where, your, uh, where your ETL and SQL ends um, uh, the, the, the Ray processing actually begins. So think, think of it that they, they're using, you know, Delta Lake and Apache Spark to do all your ETL. Because if I was, if I was going to use Delta, if I was going to use ETL for Spark streaming and for, 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 for um, uh, Spark work, for SQL workloads, I wouldn't think about anything else but Spark on Databricks using Delta, right? Once I built my, my, my lake house, I have all my data in there 
And then if I just wanted to use, pick up all, 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 all the parquet files from it and then ingest it into my, into my deep learning uh, distributed training. Let's see, I think there's something else on the chat. Greg, did I answer the question? Hope so. Does anyone else have questions for Joseph? Okay, uh, if no one else has questions for Jules, then I think we're pretty much done here. And thank you very much, Jules, for a wonderful talk. Uh, this is a very, very slick tool that you're uh, working on. Um, and, uh, you know, stay in touch. All right, thank you very much for the invite. And if you have any questions, you have my, uh, you have my contact information, feel free to drop in a line. I'm more than happy to do that or, or join in a Slack channel. Uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. I'll try to answer that uh, as well. But again, uh, Karen and Dorothy, thanks a lot for the invite. It's good to see both of you again. I feel like I'm home again. So um, <laughs> yes. stay stay healthy and hope to see you both uh, sometime in the near future. Maybe at, maybe at, at, at uh, uh, Data Plus AI Summit in a few months. Oh, okay, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. Bye. All right. right. Thanks, Joe. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Cheers.